It's my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. John Walton. Dr. Walton has for the last 17 years been a professor of Old Testament studies at Wheaton College and Graduate School in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, he holds the PhD degree from Hebrew Union College in Hebrew and Cognate Studies. And if you check the table which has a selection of some of his books particularly relevant to topics that are being addressed tonight, you'll notice that his research interests have been especially focused on the relationship of the ancient Near Eastern world to the Old Testament and how the Old Testament fits within that world uh, and how we today read it, interpret it with understanding based on seeing its context, seeing the world it fits in most naturally. So he's published a number of books. We have just a small selection then out on the table in back. I encourage you to check those out. Uh, the Cultural Background Study Bible, The Lost World of Genesis 1, The Lost World of Adam and Eve, The Lost World of the Flood are all out there and available for you. John and his wife Kim have three grown children. Interestingly, they're all pursuing academic careers. Uh, and maybe my, my personal testimony about John as a person is he's always, in my experience, been very approachable, gracious, and articulate. So it's a delight to have you here, John. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Ken, and thank you all for coming. It's a delight to have this opportunity to talk to you about things that, that I think are really important, not just for the um, academic areas that I study, but for our world today. And as, uh, as we interact in the world, talking about important things. One of the questions, the main question really, that I want to have on the table tonight for us to discuss is, how can it be that people can take the book of Genesis and the Bible seriously and take science seriously? In our world, lots of people think that that is an oxymoron, that's undoable, to be able to take both of those seriously. Now, whether you're here as someone who self-identifies as a Christian, and maybe you're here in a, in a STEM program, and maybe you've been wondering about exactly how to do that. Maybe you're someone here who used to self-identify as a Christian, and has found that so difficult to do that you're kind of in a different place right now and wondering about it all. Or maybe you've never dreamed of self-identifying as a Christian and you're wondering how those crazy Christians think about this world that seems to be pulling at itself. Well, I hope to have something here for all of you tonight as I talk about how I am able to keep science and faith in conversation and treat both seriously and how's that all work? Well, I've spent my life, at least my professional life, my career, closing in on 40 years now, hard to believe, in a quest. A quest to be a faithful interpreter of the Bible. And lots of people have different ideas about what that means and what that ends up looking like. But I'm convinced, as I'm at this point in my quest, that being a faithful interpreter of the Bible does not require us to flush our brains down or to depart from any serious treatment of science. So that's what we want to talk about today. Now, for those who are used to the Christian world, they're used to talking about the Bible as having authority. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's sort of a premise. And for some of you who self-identify as Christians, you'll want to know exactly how am I presenting this authority issue. So in that sense, not just for confessional readers, but really to talk about how Christianity thinks about 
the Bible. Uh, we basically believe that Genesis is not just any kind of literature. It's, it's not like anything else. And so we want to interpret it for what we believe that it is. Uh, my faith is such that I, I believe the Bible is God's word, and I want to interpret it faithfully that way. And to do that, we have to understand that we want to treat the Bible's claims seriously. But if we're going to treat those claims seriously, we need to know what they are. What does the Bible claim? And what doesn't it claim? We have to recognize those, and I'm going to suggest, and I think it's good method, that we have to consider that contextually. The Bible must be understood contextually, not just contextually in terms of literature context, but contextually in terms of the culture of the ancient world. Because the Bible was written for us, we believe, but more importantly for this discussion, it was not written to us. It was written in an ancient language, in an ancient world, to an ancient culture. We're reading someone else's mail. This was written to someone else. And if we're going to understand its claims and its message, we have to put ourselves in the place of those people, that audience. Now, the metaphor I like to use is that of a cultural river. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by a cultural river. We can start with our modern scenario. In our modern cultural river, there are all sorts of aspects that help us understand the world around us. Everyone is in a cultural river, and we have this modern cultural river that has all of the elements of, of politics and economics and science and philosophy and all of these elements that are kind of who we are as a culture. Now, some of these things you might like. You might say, yes, that's me. I'm for that. And that's what I want to be. I think that's right. Maybe there are some other things on that list, and the list could be much longer, of course. Maybe there are other things on that list, and you'd say, eh, I'm not quite so sure about that one, or I've got questions, or mm, maybe I need to resist that a little bit. Now, the difficulty is that even if we want to resist some of these kinds of ideas, it's very difficult to do so. Okay, so one of the things, I don't know if it's up on the list or not, I don't think so, but consumerism. Consumerism is what we are. And have you ever tried to say, well, you know, that may not be the best thing. I'm going to try not to be such a consumer. Whoa, pretty hard to do in our culture, because we're here. So we're in a cultural river, whether we resist it, whether we float gently along on its currents, whatever it might be, we're in it. And in one sense, no, not in just one sense, any culture has its cultural river. Now, this is our modern cultural river, and it's very unlike the ancient cultural river. The ancient cultural river didn't have any of these elements in it. And not only did it not have these elements, it would not understand most of these elements. It's so totally foreign to an ancient cultural river. And not only did they not have these elements, the Bible is written in that ancient cultural river, and it does not anticipate any of these. There's no place where the Bible is going to address patriotism, post-colonialism, social media. Of course not. But likewise, expanding universe, evolution, those are part of our cultural river. And the Bible does not anticipate other cultural rivers. If we were going to say that it did, we couldn't be selective. We couldn't say, well, the Bible anticipates our cultural river and no one else's. Tough luck on them, OK? If it's going to anticipate any cultural river, it would kind of have to do all of them. 
medieval France, Byzantine Rome, Stone Age Borneo, all of them, and it doesn't. And we would not read the Bible that way. The Bible operates in its cultural river. It may be for us, but it's not to us. It is written to people in the ancient world, in the ancient cultural river. Let's find out a little bit about that. What does that ancient cultural river look like? Well, as, they, as the ideas come up on the board, some of those you would say, well, I kind of get the idea what that is, um, but really that's, I don't understand it well. It's not the way that we think in our culture. It's not something that we can understand intuitively. It's part of the ancient cultural river. And the Israelites of the Bible were immersed in this cultural river. Not ours. Immersed in this cultural river. That means if we're going to understand the Bible, we have to understand its claims in light of its own cultural river. If we're going to take the Bible seriously, we have to do that within its own cultural river. Now, already that feels a little bit uncomfortable. And some of you who hold the Bible dear might be feeling like he's taking the Bible out of my hands. Because typically, lots of times Christians want to read the Bible as it is. Just want to open their texts and let it wash over them to read it as it is. I suppose that'd be wonderful if we could read any text of any culture of any language intuitively, <laughs> but we know that's not reality. And there's a problem with this reading the Bible as it is, because that usually means we're reading it from our own cultural river. When we read it as it is, it means that we're not working at trying to get to a different cultural river. We're just content to impose our cultural river on it. That, my friends, is not taking the Bible seriously. Reading instinctively is not reliable because our instincts are modern. Our instincts are our cultural river. And if we're left free to read it intuitively, we're going to read things into it that aren't there, including, by the way, science. Read things in that aren't there. We cannot take a text more literally than by understanding what the human author intended to say. That's literal reading. And again, some Christian groups really emphasize, read the Bible literally. Read the Bible literally. There's no more literal reading than to read it by what the author intended in his cultural river. You don't read literally by reading instinctively. So we have to ask the questions that the ancient audience is asking. OK, I'll share the story quickly, because it's such a good one. So little Billy, nine years old, comes into the kitchen. Mom's finishing up the dishes. And he says, Mom, where did I come from? And she panics. Oh, boy, I wasn't ready for this discussion yet. The kid's only nine. Oh, my. OK, OK, Billy. Well, um, when a man and a woman decide they like each other and they fall in love, and, that, and so she goes through it, you know, basic birds and the bees kind of discussion. Not, not at all confident that she's doing it the way she would really like to. And she finishes and she says, okay, Billy, uh, do you have any questions? I said, well, no, no, mom, I guess not. But, you know, Tommy says he comes from Indiana. Wrong question, a wrong understanding of the question, and answering the wrong question. 
We do it all the time in the Bible because we have our modern cultural river questions and we want to go to the Bible. If we take the Bible seriously, we say, well, the Bible's got an answer for my question. And sometimes we're not asking good questions. We have to ask the questions they're asking if we're going to take the text seriously and understand its claims. So, that takes us into the ancient Near East, because that's the world of Israel. That's their cultural river. That's where we find out how they thought. And when we read the Bible through this lens of the ancient Near East, we understand that the Bible is deeply embedded in that world. It's, it's not a clean slate that God started fresh with a new language, new culture, and it's not. It's, comes out of the ancient world. It's embedded in that. But that doesn't mean that the Bible literature is indebted to the literature of the ancient world. Okay, we're not thinking about the biblical authors saying, oh man, I got this cool text from Babylon and I'm going to write it for, for my people. Okay, that's indebtedness. And there's no reason to, to think that way. That's another conversation. But we're talking about the embeddedness of the text. And in that sense, we're not imposing the ancient Near East on the Bible to read it within its culture. That's not imposing something. That's recognizing what it is. After all, I don't think anybody would say that when we try to understand the Hebrew behind the text that we are imposing Hebrew on the text. You can't impose Hebrew on the text. It's in Hebrew. And it's the same thing with the ancient Near Eastern cultural context. The ancient texts then prompt us to think about the text in new ways, in different ways, ways that are not natural or instinctive to us. They give us windows into the ancient world, or as someone described it recently, they give us keyholes into the ancient world. You can't see a whole lot, but you can kind of look around and see some things keyholes into the ancient world. So if we want to be faithful interpreters, taking the Bible seriously, we have to do so by avoiding anachronisms. We can't afford to make the Bible something that it's not by reading it through our modern cultural river. OK? Now, most of what we're going to talk about tonight is how the Bible is not to us. It's a whole other conversation to say, OK, then, how is the Bible for us? I'll have to come back another time and do that one. OK, but so we're going to we have to focus on what we have to focus on. All right. So one of the ways that people try to see the compatibility or possible compatibility between the Bible and science is by a, a approach that's known as concordism. And I bring it up because it may be something that some of you are familiar with, whether you self-identify as Christian or not. I have the picture up there from a Hittite relief. And you would never look at that picture and say, oh, the Hittites knew about baseball. This is the pitcher for the Hittite team. <laughs> of course it's not that. But that's the kind of thing that concordism would sometimes do. It's a silly example. But the idea of reading something from a modern perspective when it's not that at all. Okay, this happens to be a musician in a, in a line of Hittite musicians. I knew you'd want to know. So, concordism, okay, how does it work? Concordism tends to read modern insights and culture into a biblical text. Okay, that's what they're about. It assumes that the Bible anticipates our cultural river. And that there's scientific things kind of buried there for the knowing mind to discover that God has anticipated our cultural river and put things in there. So for instance, some people who do concordism would say, when you read God spreading out the, the heavens, ah, the expanding universe. See, it's reading a modern view into something that made perfect sense in an ancient cultural river. The problem with such a view is the lack of controls. 
So for instance, when people thought that we had a steady state universe, a concordist could find all kinds of things in the Bible that suggested a steady state universe. The earth is firm and will not be moved. Steady state universe. Well then, science decided steady state universe didn't work so well and you get Big Bang cosmology. And a concordist can turn around and say, ah, the Bible tells us about Big Bang cosmology and starts talking about passages. There's no controls there. No matter what science is, you can kind of squeeze something out of it, but that's not dealing with the Bible's claims. The Bible is not claiming a steady state or a Big Bang cosmology. We want to know the Bible's claims, and we need controls to do that. Now, so when we go to the biblical text, we find out that they do not think of the world the way we think of the world. They apparently thought it was oblong. Sorry for the screen resolution. Okay, so <laughs> Blue Earth, we know this. You could tell me everything on that and interpret it because this is part of our cultural river of how we think about the world around us. But we can't think that they saw the world that way. You give this to an ancient Israelite or a Babylonian or an Egyptian, they had no idea what they're even looking at. Ooh, pretty colors. They would have no idea what this was a picture of or how to interpret anything on it. So we can't read this into the Bible. God certainly did not give the Israelites this view of the cosmos. The view he gave them was more like this. A solid sky, waters above, flat earth, mountains holding up the sky. Sun, moon, and stars inside the snow globe. I mean, sorry, the solid sky. <laughs> okay? And so this is how they thought. Temple at the top, connected to the temple on earth. This is the way they viewed the cosmos. And God didn't tell them any differently. Because the Bible is not revealing the truth of cosmic geography. God spoke to them in their cultural river. Now, on a topic that it makes a difference, we often think, well, is something that the Bible talks about, is, the, is it natural or supernatural? Because these are the categories that we use. But the trouble is, or the fact is, nothing, nothing is natural in the ancient world. They had no such category. They could talk about things being ordinary, normal, but not natural. If by natural we talk about happening by a natural cause and effect process led by the laws of nature that operate freely without God doing anything. Because that's how we tend to think of what's natural. And we have arguments in the Bible whether the plagues, can they be explained by natural cause and effect? Or do we have to consider them miracles? We have these arguments. The fact is, you can't really discuss that in the context of the Old Testament because the Old Testament has no category natural. And if the Bible can't designate something as natural, then there's no meaning to something that's supernatural. Those are our categories in our post-enlightenment cultural river, not their categories, because to them, God was involved in everything. God is the recognized agent, even in what we call natural. That's how they thought. So if you're saying, is the Bible claiming that XYZ was a miracle? Well, if you mean by that, that they were designating it as supernatural rather than natural, Tommy says he's from Indiana. We're asking the wrong question. They don't have the category. God was involved in everything in the way that they thought about it. Different levels of agency, different levels of causation, we would say, but that, even that's our language. They don't have levels of causation. They don't distinguish at what level God's agency was working. 
They thought differently. And if we try to push our questions into their context, we're going to confuse the Bible's claims. Another quick example, physiology. In the ancient world, they have no knowledge of brain physiology. No idea what that gray stuff up there does. Now, you can see this in Egyptian mummification. They were very, very keen on preserving the identity of the person. And we would say that a person's identity is connected with their brain. But they don't know that. And so the Egyptians would carefully take out the, the liver and the kidneys and the stomach. They would do all kinds of things with the heart in order to preserve the identity of the person. Brain, you know what they did with that. Hook up the nose, pull it out, throw it away. Because the brain had nothing to do with the person's identity. And the Israelites thought the same way. There's no Hebrew word for brain. When it talks about mind in some of your translations, the Hebrew word is entrails. Okay? So, they have an ancient physiology concept, not a modern one. And the identity of the self was connected to other things than the brain. And God doesn't correct it. Because the Bible is not revealing physiology. The Bible speaks into that ancient cultural river. So, some quick conclusions on this part. This is not conclusions to the whole talk. I'm not near done. Okay? <laughs> Last night I was at a lecture on campus, and the speaker started by saying, I'm going to talk for 15 minutes, then the rest of the time is open up for questions. He spoke for an hour and 15 minutes before he took a breath. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so I'm not done yet. I'm no, no delusion here. Okay, so the observation of natural cause and effect does not remove God from the picture. Again, there's no natural, there's no supernatural. Everything's supernatural in one sense. God's an agent in everything. And so when the Bible says, you knit me together in my mother's womb, we can't refute that by giving a discussion about how the, the, the egg is fertilized and implants and the, the fetus grows. And, Giving natural explanations doesn't change that conviction that God is working as an agent in that process. That's a faith statement, not a science statement. So even when we can say, here's the natural cause and effect sequence of what? Of the plagues, of evolution, that doesn't rule God out of the picture. Because God is always viewed as agent. There is no scientific revelation in the Bible. None. Zero. It's all to that cultural river, and God doesn't correct their science. He does not reveal science. He reveals himself and his plans and purposes. But he addresses their world as it is. So we must consider carefully what claims the Bible is actually making before we can start comparing them to the claims that science makes. If the Bible is not making scientific claims, if the Bible does not have scientific revelation, we would anticipate that there shouldn't be any problems. But we better move on. So I'm at this point going to move very quickly through the position that I promote on Genesis 1 and 2. I usually spend a lot more time with this, but we don't have time to do that. So I'm going to very briefly summarize it. This is the material that's in some of the books on the back table, Lost World of Genesis 1, Lost World of Adam and Eve. So uh, excuse me, I apologize for not giving you all the supporting evidence to demonstrate these views, but we can do what we can do. Okay, so the claims of Genesis 1. First of all, when Genesis 1 talks about the origins of the cosmos, they're really talking about the role and purpose that something has in an ordered system. It is an ordering process 
more than a manufacturing process. And I would prefer to refer to it as an account of cosmic identity rather than an account of cosmic origins. Because in our cultural river, when we hear the word origins, we think science. But the Bible is not talking about scientific origins. It's talking about the identity. What is the cosmos? What is it? How did the identity of the cosmos come to be? In that sense, it's like a vision statement for the cosmos. A vision statement helps you understand purpose, identity. So a few years ago, um, I teach mostly at the grad school. And the grad school has been around for, oh, 60, 70 years. And they were trying to kind of raise the profile of the graduate school and let its identity be more known. And so they said, OK, wait, we, we don't have a vision statement. Ah, you know, in today's world, you know, that's just uh, un, un, yeah. OK, so we don't have a vision statement. Got to get us a vision statement. Got to get me one, you know? And so committees are formed, and wording is tried out, and you know, wordsmithing, and sending it up to the administration, having come back, and right, all of this. Finally, after a year or two, you know, OK, we've got one. We've got a vision statement. Banners, and balloons, and confetti, and parties, and writing on the walls, you know. We've got a vision statement, yeah, yes. OK? So we get a vision statement. The next day, what changed? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> same students, same curriculum, same courses, same faculty. What changed? Nothing. But everything. Because even though those things didn't change, it now became an issue of, who are we? Now we have something formal, formalized of who we are. And everything that we've been doing for 60 years now is honed toward this vision statement. This is our purpose. This is what we're up to. And so in that sense, it's not like the things actually changed, but our understanding of them changed. And that's why I call Genesis 1 the vision statement for the cosmos. It doesn't mean that the sun had never shined before, that there had never been light before, that there had never been birds or fish before. But now all of that has given meaning in the purpose of the ordering of the cosmos in Genesis 1. Well, what is that purpose? It's not just making things manufacturing physical objects. Make is a word in Hebrew, the translation, the word, uh, that pertains to some agency. Doesn't know what level. So God could make something over billions of years as it became what it was going to be. God could make something in a blink of an eye, the snap of a finger. The word make doesn't convey that. Now, the, what I use to communicate this is the metaphor of a difference between building a house and making a house a home. Let's talk about it just for a moment. I think this is a helpful analogy. When we talk about building a house, <coughs> excuse me, what does that pertain to? In our modern cultural river, that's kind of how we think about it. And it involves the walls and the foundations and the plumbing and the electricity and the roof and insulation and all of those things. And in that sense, we could talk about the cosmos, the creation story of the cosmos, as a house story. How God built the physical structure. That would be an origin story. It could even be an identity story, although that's harder. But a house story. And that's how most people in our cultural river think immediately when they read a creation story. It must be a house story, because that's our cultural river. And in that sense, science provides a very usable plot for a house story of the cosmos. The house is what you live in, and we live in this cosmos, and that's what it would be. 
but there's another creation story sitting around here, and that would be more in the ancient cultural river. And here we're thinking about not a house story, but creation as a home story, making a home. Now, of course, the home needs a house, maybe, arguably at least. Uh, they're, they're interdependent, but still a home story is very different from the house story. How do you make a house your home? Sometimes when we have students over for dinner, we'll sit around in the, the sunroom there, and they might ask us about our place. And when they do that, they really don't want to hear the house story. They don't want me to tell them about our plumbing, or our air conditioning, or our furnace, and how old it is, or kind of the problems we've been having with the tile floors in the bathroom. They don't really care. But they want to know about how we've made this our home. That includes the pictures on the walls, the kinds of furniture that we've used to decorate, uh, whatever how we've arranged the house. When we moved into the house, there was a room that very clearly was built to be a dining room. We said, we don't need a dining room. We've got a big enough eat-in area, and so we don't want to use that as a dining room. We want to make it a den. And so we decorated it as a den, and we use it as a den, and we call it a den, and it's a den. We created the den. <laughs> I feel powerful. That's a home story. And it actually differs some with the house story, where that room had a different function. Theology provides the plot for the home story. So if you want to go to science, you're going to get a house story. That's good. House stories are good. But the Bible story is not so much a house story, in my view. Again, I'm just presenting the way I read it. The Theology provides the plot for the home story. Home is where your story comes to life. I got that from a real estate commercial, but I really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so home is where your story comes to life. It's, it's where life happens. And it talks about the ordering of things. Do you see, they're different stories. They're both origin stories but they're very different sorts of stories, and you would draw different claims and different information from them. A home resolves homelessness. Okay, so we have all of those issues. Which is the most important story? Maybe we could argue about that for quite some time, but you know, in terms of the biblical story, I'd much rather hear the home story than the house story. As science people, those of you who are science people, you might be real curious about the house story. Well, do your science. You're not going to get the house story from the Bible. And so again, the claims are not conflicting. Now, what is this purpose? What is this home supposed to be? In my, my view, uh, it talks about the cosmos as sacred space. Sacred space isn't a magic term here. It's just a matter of the idea that God intends to dwell among his people. God's going to live here. And that makes it sacred. That's part of his purpose. He has ordered it to be a place where he will dwell among his people. We see that eventually happening in the temple, God dwelling among his people. We see it in the Garden of Eden, God dwelling among his people. We see it in the Incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We see it at Pentecost, where the Spirit comes down and indwells the people of God who then are identified as the temple, God dwelling in them. So the idea of God intending sacred space for this cosmos, that's the home story. It's not a science story. It's about order and role and purpose. In the ancient world, God's rest in temples, and temples are constructed for God's to rest in. We read about God resting in day seven, and we say, what's up with that? I think God got tired, exhausted, needed downtime, a little snooze. Not very good theology supporting all of that. But in the ancient world, God's rest in temples Therefore, an Israelite in their cultural river would read about God resting, and they say, temple. And we say, what? <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense to us in our cultural river. 
The temple was not just like the Lincoln bedroom where somebody could sleep. The temple was the control room of the cosmos. It's the command center, captain's on the bridge. God is on his throne. When God rests in a temple, he sits on the throne and he rules the cosmos, which is ordered for that very purpose. Now again, if you come as a non-Christian, that's not a theology that you invest in, but you certainly must understand that it's not science, it's theology. And that's the claims that the text is making. The theology of rest in the Bible has to do with rest being security and stability. Rest in the Bible is not the opposite of activity. Rest in the Bible is the opposite of unrest. It is not disengagement, it's engagement. So again, we read it, if we read it through our intuition, through our cultural river, we get all the wrong ideas. So God ceases his ordering activity to now take command. The shop is set up, he's ready to open for business. The seven days is the setting up of the shop. The ordering of the cosmos for this purpose. So, people may be the climax, that is, God is setting it up to work for people, but rest is the climax of the account. Rest is the main goal of creation. Again, not disengagement. Ordered stability is what God was shooting for, a place where he would live among his people. Resting expresses having control over an ordered system. That's why you can sit down. Everything's in control. Well, we're going to have students over for dinner. We work hard for a couple days getting everything ready, preparing the food, cleaning the house, getting everything set. And when that's all done, we sit down. We're ready. It's all under control. And look at this. We've got three and a half minutes to burn before they come. <laughs> OK, so it's engagement, not disengagement. So the rest God gives resolves unrest. So the seven days in Genesis, we shouldn't think in terms of science and how long it took God to build the house. See, that's when you're reading is a house story. God's setting up a home. Different story. And the seven days have to do with setting up a home. When the temples are built in the ancient world, you build the structure and that's all done. It's a structure, but it's not a temple. It's not a temple until God's in it. How does that happen? How do you make the transition from house to home? The house built for God and when it becomes his home? Well, they do it through an inauguration celebration, a dedication celebration. And those dedication celebrations to trans, transfer the idea from a house to a home takes place in Seven days. That's not seven days for building the house. That's seven days for inaugurating the home. So the temple inauguration gives us an idea of what claim the Bible's making. It comes into the claim that the cosmos is a sacred space. It brings order. It's not making things. It's not as if the whole cosmos, the material cosmos, has to be manufactured in those seven days. The seven days then has nothing to do with the age of the earth. And therefore, the Bible has no opinion about the age of the earth. The Bible makes no claims about the age of the earth because that seven days is not connected to the material stuff of the earth that would lead us to ask about its age. So scientific information about the age of the earth cannot possibly be in conflict or contradiction to a biblical claim about the age of the earth if the Bible makes no claim about the age of the earth. Genesis 2, I know I'm moving fast, sorry. So what are the claims of Genesis 2? Okay. Formed from dust, we often think, oh, chemistry. 
the dust, let me see, silicates and, uh, okay, ancient cultural river, they don't know chemistry, their periodic table is very small, oh wait, <laughs> don't have one. <laughs> and it's not even craftsmanship, you know, God kind of getting down in the mud and crafting with his hands, breathing with his breath, it's not that, because it's not clay, it's dust, different word. Clay can't be shaped very well. I'm sorry, clay can. Dust can't. It falls apart. You say, well, God could do it. No, no, that doesn't count. Okay? <laughs> Stay, dust. Okay? <laughs> okay? What's the importance of dust? It's not the raw materials. It's the identity of humans because dust equals mortality. The Bible tells you so. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. It's what we are. It's not about God creating people immortal. Dust is mortality. He created them mortal. Sometimes we think that Paul says he created them immortal. No. Paul knows very well that there's a tree of life in the garden. And immortal people wouldn't need a tree of life. A tree of life brings life. If they already had life, what good would that do? So what's this dust thing all about? Well, we find out that all of us are made from dust. Psalm 103. He knows how we're formed. He remembers that we're dust. We are dust. Okay? Everyone. So when we think about dust in Genesis 2, we're not thinking about how Adam was uniquely formed, different from everybody else. You know, everybody else is born from a woman. Adam, though, uh-uh, he's the dust thing. You know? <laughs> the dust bunny. Now, okay, so, <laughs> okay, but no, the Bible tells us this is everybody. We're all dust. Every human being is formed from dust. Even Paul says it, first man of dust and all from dust. This is our humanity, our mortality. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay. So if we're all formed by God and our dust, there's nothing to preclude Adam being born of a woman because this is about identity, not biological material origins. Now, at this point, I should probably pause for like eight minutes and let you absorb that, but we don't have time. Got to move on. Okay? This is not material origin. This is not science. This is identity intended to communicate what all humans are, not how Adam first came to be. This means that Adam is an archetype. And I mean by that that he represents what we all are. We are all dust. Okay, now let's work through a couple of these issues with archetypes. That means it pertains to everyone, not just to a particular individual or individuals. This is telling us about our human identity. The names Adam and Eve themselves are archetypal. I know that because they're Hebrew. And I know that Adam and Eve didn't speak Hebrew. Hebrew did not come to exist as a language until after Moses. And so we know that Adam and Eve did not speak Hebrew, and therefore they did not call each other Adam and Eve, because those are Hebrew words with Hebrew meaning. I think it was honey and sweetie, but I don't know. Um, but it wasn't Adam and Eve. So already we've got archetypes. Adam means human. Eve means life. Archetypal. Okay? So on the internet, uh, there's an interviewer interviewing second graders. And he says to them, so what are mothers made of? And one little girl says, mothers are made of clouds and angel wings and rainbows and a little dab of mean. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Now, you know, these are second graders, but they kind of understood the idea of archetypes right away. You know, don't go biology on me here. The angel wings would throw me for a loop. Okay, what? 
archetype, kind of, there's something about identity here. It's not biology, we're not talking science. Now it's interesting that even in chapter two, verse seven of Genesis, it doesn't say God formed Adam from the dust. It says God formed humanity, dust of the ground. There's no word from there. The Hebrew preposition is not there. That reads differently, doesn't it? Because Adam means humanity. God formed humanity, dust of the earth. Hmm. So the Bible makes no claim here about biological origins. Furthermore, even the term formed, form is something you do to identity, not to a physical body. Zechariah 12.1, God forms, same Hebrew verb, forms the spirit within man. He forms the identity. And so our question is not, is this good biology? Does this work with genetics? Our question is, is this what people really are? Mortal? Dust? Is this what we are? Is this our identity? There's the truth of the Bible's claim. The Bible's claim here is not science. Identity and image both pertain in the Bible to population. Genesis 1, God created humanity in male and female variety. And he gave them his image. The population is the image of God, not each individual. The Bible never talks of an individual being in the image of God. It's the human population, humanity, that is the image of God. And we find that this squares with the ancient Near East, in which also every discussion of human origins is archetypal, not biological. It has to do with identity. Woman from the side of man, have to move quickly. Adam knows it's not just a rib. Look what he says, first words out of his mouth. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's more than a rib going on here. I had some ribs at dinner and it was more bone of my bone than it was flesh of my flesh, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, I hate it when that happens. Okay, but, okay, there's something more going on here. Okay, ah, back up, back up. Okay, never mind. Okay, yeah, if we go to look at all the places where this word rib, the Hebrew word translated that way is used in the Old Testament. We can find out what, what anatomy it refers to. Let's take a look at every one of them. We're done. This is the only place where it's anatomical. It sometimes is architectural. Most of the time, every other time, it's architectural. And it refers to a side of something. So God took one of Adam's sides, and he only had two. You know, when the surgeon takes one of your kidneys, well, you know, you've got one left. Okay, and this idea was that she was the same as him. Now, this happened in a deep sleep. That's not for anesthesia. Cultural river. You know, they're not thinking of surgery. They didn't do surgery unless they hacked off a limb. Okay, and that's not this. But that word for deep sleep is used for a visionary state. So Adam sees himself being cut in half in a vision, not on the surgery table. And he comes to understand that that's an explanation of how man and woman relate. This is human identity. Hmm, okay. I see we are running into problems here. Why is this not turning? Oh my, that's bad. Um, hmm, hmm, okay. Ah, okay. So the message of identity in the Genesis archetypes. First of all, human identity created with mortal bodies, dust. Relationship identity, they are serving in sacred space. Ontological identity, they're different from animals. Adam's naming all the animals. Nope, nothing here like me, okay? Gender identity, divided into male and female. This is an identity story. 
not a scientific origins story. Okay, now, let's move on to considering the claims of Bible and science. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay, there are a number of different approaches that are represented in major organizations. There's Answers in Genesis, six-day creationism. Uh, they claim they read the Bible literally, and they build a science out of the Bible. They use scripture to determine what science ought to be. That's a form of concordism. We have reasons to believe Hugh Ross and his organization. They're old earth, but they don't believe in evolution, and they use science to determine scripture. That is, they're very comfortable reading science in between the lines of scripture. By the way, I'm trying to describe these very carefully in terms that they would say, yes, that's what I believe. Okay, because I don't want any straw men here. All right, so that's reasons to believe. Third, the Discovery Institute. This is the intelligent design group. And so they have a particular thing they're trying to do, but they are largely critiquing evolution as inadequate. Okay, and they typically ignore God in scripture. Oh, by their, by their choice because they just want to talk about the science. They just want to critique the science. Then we have Biologos. Biologos um, advocates for what they call evolutionary creation. That is God being very involved in the creation process that we describe by an evolutionary model. And they recognize scripture as an ancient text. All of these have great websites and you can find out all about them, loads of articles, you can find out all about them. There's also the ASA, the American Scientific Affiliation, which doesn't really take any position. They've got people of all these different groups involved there. Again, for, these, for you people who don't self-identify as Christian, you need to recognize that there are all these variations, because these are all Christian organizations, and all these variations about how to think about science and the Bible, okay? Christianity is not all answers in Genesis, okay? Biologos is made up of many, many, many scientists who self-identify as Christians and yet accept what they call evolutionary creation. So there are many varieties here and you can find out about them. Now, of course, sometimes we tend to think that the, the most um, accurate, most conservative, is the one that's most traditional. But we should really ask, which one has the most conservative hermeneutic? It's all about how you go about interpreting scripture. And I would say that Biologos is, because they try to treat the text for what it is, an ancient text. Now, full disclosure, I'm on the advisory board of Biologos, okay? <laughs> but, there's a reason for that. <laughs> okay, so these are the variations of how we approach the question. So don't think that it's all monolithic. Okay, so what is evolution? Really quick, because most of you know this. Okay, it's an interpretation of the world that posits material continuity, change over time. That itself is not inherently atheistic or deistic. Again, evolutionary creationists like Biologos see it as fully guided by God. Again, evolution describes a mechanism, and most scientists are not satisfied with the mechanisms of evolution, and that's one of the things that intelligent design critiques. The mechanisms are not adequate, but most evolutionary biologists recognize that we don't yet have a clear bead on all the mechanisms. Okay, but evolution does describe a mechanism, and it doesn't describe agency. The Bible, creation, describes agency. So in that sense, there is not a conflict. So putting together the theological issues. Here I'm just talking about a plausible model. I want to avoid concordism, so I don't want to read the Bible scientifically. But at the right time, in his purposes, God conferred his image on all people. Image is corporate. God gave the image. It's something only he can do. The image of God cannot evolve because it's a task, a function, an identity that is given. This identity and function is given by God. It makes human beings distinct. Adam and Eve, I'm willing to believe, were real people in a real past, are representatives, 
through whose actions we all become accountable for sin, but that doesn't mean they are the first and only. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. We can talk of them as the first, the way we talk about the president's wife as the first lady, or Washington and Franklin and Jefferson as the founding fathers. Adam is a father of the human race. But again, that's not a biological statement. So we're consequently doomed to death without the remedy of the death of Christ, which provides our salvation. That's theology. That's not science. When we put together the scientific issues, God's creation of humans could have involved a long process, conceived, designed, executed, such that it resulted in phylogenetic continuity between species via change over time from a common ancestor. Nothing wrong with that view of God's work. Again, the Bible insists God is the agent. There's no need to accept any particular evolutionary model since the mechanisms posited remain uncertain and controversial. The model is compatible with faithful interpretation of the text and can be consistently maintained within a framework of orthodox theology because the Bible is not making scientific claims. People have problems with evolution. What are some of those problems? Well, it requires long amounts of time. Well, yeah, that's true. Requires death. Some people think that there's not enough time. If they think that the Bible claims a young earth, you can't have evolution. It takes a lot of time. But we saw the Bible doesn't claim a young earth. They say it requires death, and, and the Bible says that people were created immortal. No, it doesn't. Talked about that. So that's not a problem with death before the fall. Okay? It's messy. The uh, Bible says that it was good. How can red in tooth and claw be good? Because the word good talks about that it's ordered the way God wants it to be ordered. It's functional at the, at the, to the extent that God needs it to work. That's not a moral term. They say evolution needs, leaves no room for God. Well, only if you leave him out. <laughs> There's no reason why evolution couldn't have God in the picture. If God's involved in that process in some way, the critique of evolution, insufficient mechanisms. Well, people keep working on it. That's what scientists do. Okay? So how about problems people have with biblical creation? Well, it requires de novo, kind of quick and immediate and, and fully developed. And no, it doesn't, because I tried to demonstrate that's not what Genesis 2 suggests. It requires supernatural involvement. Well, again, from a biblical standpoint, God's involved in everything. So that, that doesn't mean that it could not have involved natural processes. It requires a young earth. No, the Bible does not require a young earth. Some people have interpreted it that way. Has no death. Again, these are interpretations. And I've tried to show that there are alternate interpretations sustainable when we read the text as an ancient text. That it denies genetic continuity. Again, no, it does not necessarily do so. Critique, the Bible's just mythology. No, don't throw away around genre titles so casually. Uh, ca genre is a very important study, uh, and mythology, what we call mythology as we use the term today, is really very different from how we might think about any ancient literature, biblical or otherwise. Some conclusions. Agency is more important than mechanism. From a biblical standpoint, some of you are STEM people, and for you, mechanism is very, very important. It's the career you've chosen. It's the life that you want to live. It's the curiosity that motivates you. I'm happy for you. But biblically, agency is the issue not mechanism. Be free, do your science, as a Christian or not. It's not gonna pose a problem to the Bible. God has made us to be more than what he made us from. That's really important. God made us to be more than he made us from. Whether you think it was a primordial pool of algae or I don't know what, or dust, your primates or what he made us 
to be is more important than what he made us from. I could talk about that at length, but I don't have time. All humanity today traces its identity to Adam and Eve, but that's not genetic. Our identity, whether the genetics works out or not, just like all Jews trace their ancestry. Now, that's not a good example. Uh, Jews can trace their, their connection to Moses, even though they're not from Moses' line. The acceptance of science does not require the rejection of Bible or faith. You can read both the Bible seriously as an ancient document and science seriously for all that it can offer us. Thank you. Some of the books are going to be flashing on the screen as we talk. You can just watch the pretty colors. OK. <laughs> oh, hello. Well, we're going to go into a period of question and answer here. And I'll start it off by asking one question of Dr. Walton, as long as his chair continues yeah, to behave uh, there. We yeah. hope this is safe. <laughs> Usually rockers go this way. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. It's a special University of Illinois invention. Yeah. It's a side to side rocker. So, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, based on what you're saying, it sounds like there's a lot, a lot of room, actually, that a person, if they're a Christian believer or not a Christian believer, and they're involved in scientific work, they're committed to seeking the scientific data and taking that seriously, that they don't have to disregard the biblical text and vice versa, that a person who takes the Bible seriously and says, this is God's word to me, uh, it can also be open to the wealth of scientific data that's out there. And again, that's the point of all of this, um, that the serious interpretation of the Bible, a faithful interpretation of the Bible, does not cut off all of what we learn and, and love and appreciate about science and what it tells us. These are not enemies. This is not warfare. This is not conflict. Okay, and so people who take the Bible seriously don't have to be scared of the sciences. People who are convinced of the sciences don't have to say, I'm sorry, I can't be involved with the Bible. Not on this count, at least. So, yeah, I think that's really an important, uh, important element. In that sense, the freedom to live in both worlds and have them be part of your worldview. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to turn the mic at this point over to Dr. Todd Daly, who is our theology and ethics prof, who's going to run it to the people who have questions. So at this point, <laughs> it's you all and Dr. Walton. Okay. Uh, it, in order to make this somewhat manageable, I'm going to take a, a question from each section and uh, uh, keep working idea. my way back. And if you're sitting near the top, if you could please just not ask any questions. <laughs> uh, oh, we want to see you get your work <laughs> out. <laughs> right. uh, so uh, uh, we'll start here with anyone, and uh, great. <laughs> Is three rows okay? That's a, that's a <laughs> Hi. Um, so in your talk, I feel like you discussed quite a bit about the, the sixth day and the identity of Adam and the identity of Eve. You talked about the seventh day and God resting and the, the, how that corresponds with a temple. Um, how would you interpret the, the first through fifth days and what each of those mm -hmm. is supposed to mean within your framework? Good, thanks. And again, those are some of the things I had to pass over, so I'm glad you asked them in the questions. It gives me more time. Uh, so, I didn't plant that, really. So, on, on, the, on the early days in Genesis 1, again, what I try to bring out is that they all have to do with understanding the way the cosmos is ordered in order to support people. That is, God has crafted a place for people, and it works for them. We see it because, for instance, in day one, it talks about being light. Light is not material. And furthermore, he names the light day. Interesting, he doesn't name it light. 
That would have been obvious. He doesn't name it light, he names it day. And that's talking about how the human world is ordered day and night, as how people have their lives regulated. That's not something material. Day two, it just says God created space in which people live. That's not material. Day three, it says, let the dry land emerge. Doesn't say God made it. Well, I've got no problem that God made it, but it doesn't say that. That's not what it's focused on. And it talks about how plants should sprout and drop seed and sprout and drop seed and sprout and over and over and over because that provides food for people. This is bringing order to the human world. When it gets talking about the sun, moon, and stars, it doesn't treat them as objects, a rock in orbit in space reflecting the light of a burning ball of gas. That, okay? It doesn't treat them as objects because in the ancient world they didn't know they were objects. It treats them as regulators for signs and seasons and days and years, regulating human life and activity. And so again, that's ordering. That's not the material stuff. And day five, God put wallpaper on the computer screen. Birds and fish and everything flying around, you know, moving around, swimming around. This is the human world that has been populated with all of these wonderful creatures for them to explore. Again, that's populations. Let them team. Let them swarm. Again, it doesn't really talk about God materially making something. So that gives you the gist, uh, that it's all about ordering our world and environment, not so much about crafting material objects. OK, middle, middle section, anyone? Thank you for being close to the. <laughs> then how would you explain the very first verse where it says, in the beginning, God created mm -hmm. the heavens and the earth? Okay. If you're saying that he did not do it. Anything Wonderful. Like Another slide I skipped, so thank you. Um, <laughs> they, OK, first of all, I, most scholars uh, recognize now that Genesis 1.1 is not talking about a separate, distinct act of creation. It stands as a literary introduction to the chapter. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me tell you how he did it. The earth was without form and void. And so then it goes into it. So Genesis 1 introduces the story. Now the word creation, create, the verb there, also needs to be understood in its ancient context. I wouldn't translate it any differently. But in the ancient world, they thought of creation as a very different kind of activity than what we tend to think about today. We tend to think about material as an act of material manufacture. At least in a scientific context, that's kind of what we would automatically think. But in the ancient world, they thought of creating as an act of order bringing. And they used terms like separating and naming, which we have in Genesis 1. Separating and naming are a creation because they give something identity. They bring about order. And in the ancient world, the bringing about order was the most important aspect of creation. So the Egyptians have a word that we translate the non-existent. And they'll talk about the desert being non-existent. And the ocean is being non-existent. Clearly, they're thinking about existence in a different way than we do. Because in our cultural river, we think of existence as material. They did not. They think of existence as having to do with having a role and a function in an ordered system for people. And so anything that's not seen as having a role and a purpose in an ordered system is non-existent. And that's things like the desert and the ocean. So when, in the ancient world, when they say that God created something, they're talking about an order bringing activity, not a material making activity. Thank you. OK, uh, the first hand I saw was uh, up here. Um, how would you explain the story of Noah's Ark? <laughs> a 
Lost World of the Flood is right out on the table. Um, <laughs> again, I want to read it within a, the ancient context. Uh, I want to read it for what it is. Um, the, uh, when the biblical narrator is telling us this story, he's not trying to tell the Israelites about an event that none of them would have known about before. He's not trying to say, I've got to tell you something. There's this event that happened. You won't believe it. Here's, here's what it is. Not at all. Everybody in the ancient world knew there was a massive flood. So that was part of what they knew in their cultural river. And many of the societies, many of the cultures had this awareness. What the biblical text is trying to do is say, OK, fine, we all know that there was this flood. What do you make of that? What, what was God doing? Why did he do it? And that's where you find the Babylonian story is very different from the Genesis story, because they have a totally different interpretation of what God was doing and why he did it. So the text is making interpretive claims about this major, well-known cataclysm. Is it trying to give us scientific details that would allow us to reconstruct the event uh, geologically and hydrologically? Absolutely not. They don't care about such things. Okay? They're not trying to help us reconstruct the scientific accuracy or authenticity of the flood. They present it as major cataclysms are all presented in the ancient world using a universalistic rhetoric. It's very common for presenting cataclysms in the ancient world. They talk about it in universalistic terms. All of it, everything, nothing. But that's not the reality. We know that because we've got passages where the biblical authors talk about the uh, destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and they describe it in utterly universalistic terms. And we know that everybody wasn't killed. There were, there were exiles, and they came back later on, and the, there were people that survived in the land. We know everybody wasn't killed, but it, it speaks in those universalistic terms. That's the rhetoric of cataclysm. And it really doesn't tell you what the scientific extent of the flood was. Basically, the text doesn't allow us to reconstruct that, because that's not its job. Its job is to tell us what God was doing. And in the Lost World of the Flood, uh, it covers from chapter 4 of Genesis through chapter 11, and it puts the flood in that context that's moving from creation to covenant, and puts the flood in the context of how is the author presenting the interpretation of this passage to square with what God's plans and purposes were, across that time period that is the backstory for the covenant of God with Israel. So again, uh, for people who find Christianity unacceptable, whether they used to be in it or not, they find it unacceptable because of scientifically implausible things like a global flood, think again. Is that the claim of the text? I would say that it's not. And lots of people would disagree with me, but I think that we can read the text faithfully without trying to think in those terms. Great back, oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Just help a brother out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so in the Christian narrative, um, it's commonly thought that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like a very implausible thing to happen in our modern day and age. Mm -hmm. So epistemologically, I'm wondering how Maybe you use your methods to adjudicate between, you know, the flood didn't happen necessarily, creation story didn't happen, but Jesus definitely happened, you know. Okay. Well, they happened. You know, I'm not saying the flood didn't happen. It did, and it was massive and cataclysmic, but I can't reconstruct the extent of it. Uh, creation happened. God did create. He ordered the cosmos. It was a place where he intended to dwell. So it happened. It's just when we try to reconstruct it scientifically, that we run into obstacles. Because again, the text isn't making claims about those kinds of issues. When we get to the resurrection, the text is making a different level of claims. The text actually goes to some extent to say, and here were eyewitnesses, and here's the evidence that it happened, and here's the responses of the people that were involved, and it goes to great lengths. Not to reconstruct how it could be that someone could raise from the dead, 
but rather that there is evidence to that fact. So again, the text is treating it very differently. When I talk about the flood account as being hyperbolic, that's tied to a genre, a genre of cosmic cataclysm. Well, the resurrection is not in that category. It's not talking about cosmic cataclysm. We can't just say, well, if the Bible uses hyperbole anywhere, then I can apply it anywhere I want. We have to be careful literary readers. So that's how I would see the difference between them. Thanks for asking that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hi, Dr. Walton. Hey, Russell. Uh, thanks for spending so much time on our campus. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure you get this question a lot, so I'm sorry uh, if it's ex exasperating, but um, <laughs> kind of connected to Paul and his theology, seems like in his writings in Corinthians and Romans and Timothy that he uses Adam's firstness to justify a couple claims about um, sin entering the world, and then Jesus being that second Adam, but then also for gender roles, using Adam being created before Eve mm -hmm. as justification for some of his theology on uh, those issues. And I was just curious how you've um, interacted with those passages and those ideas in your paradigm, with Adam not necessarily being first Russell is one of two people in this audience who were in my sixth grade Sunday school class. <laughs> Trained him well. <laughs> that was months ago. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, Romans, Corinthians. Uh, they're in the New Testament, right? Back by the maps? Yeah, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> Just as the narrator in Genesis is interpreting the creation story, interpreting Adam and Eve in the story of the garden, interpreting it with a God-given understanding that is theologically important to us, so the New Testament authors are interpreting the Adam and Eve story. They're interpreting it with regard to their own questions in their own time, which is a different time, Greco-Roman period, very different from the ancient Near East, and they're appropriating it for their theological questions. They're using not only the material from Genesis, which we're familiar with, they also are using the material that is well known from the Jewish literature of the Hellenistic period between the Old and New Testaments. And all of those are informing the cultural river of the Greco-Roman world. So Adam isn't, I'm sorry, Adam, Paul I'm talking about. Paul is not trying to interpret what Genesis means in the context of the ancient Near East and Genesis. He's trying to appropriate the Adam story for theological points, which he is making, which are very important theological points. And he's trying to, uh, to work through that process. As a result, Paul uses sort of the Adam that they all know in the Greco-Roman world, the Adam that they all have come to understand in certain um, contexts, cultural, theological, literary, all of those things. Um, so Paul builds this idea of this relationship between Adam and Christ and sort of a, a relationship between what they do and how they work. But they're both working as archetypes. After all, Christ might be considered the last man, but he's not the last man. And he's serving an archetypal role as it pertains to all of us and representing all of us, as Adam does as well. So I don't think that changes what I've said about the Genesis story. It just gives new appropriation to it in an important theological context. You can fully believe and be totally convinced of Adam as being the fountainhead of sin in the human world without thinking that he is the first and only biological um, example of the species. In other words, we can unbundle the science from the theology. And that doesn't mean that we question or throw away the theology, the importance of the fact that we all sin and that we all are in need of salvation, which Christ provides, 
that, that all works. And Adam is just being used as a, a way to put that piece together. But again, what are Paul's claims? Is Paul making biological genetic claims? And I'm not convinced he is. Again, other people might think differently. OK, someone up from this section. Uh, hi. Um, so I, I like what you're attempting to do, because it, it's sort of scientific, right? You're trying to show, like, look, the scientists and the Christians, we don't have to disagree. We can have our cake and eat it, too. These things can be internally consistent. I like cake. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. <laughs> and I'm just curious. It, you've picked examples where you can say, yes, there's a way, a literary way of reading this to say, look, there isn't actually any conflict. I'm just curious, are you confident that this can be done for every claim that's made in the Bible? That nowhere you might eventually run into a thing where it's like, okay, maybe this is diametrically opposed. Well, since, the bi in, since in my view, the Bible is not revealing science, it never does, and since therefore it's not making scientific claims, I don't know of any, then I can't imagine any place where there could be a conflict. Uh, again, the Old Testament, um, I've worked through it very thoroughly, and I know of nothing that would cause a, a problem. It's accommodated to that cultural river. And therefore the science, to the extent that you can even call it science, is their science, not ours. So in that sense, if the Bible is not making scientific claims, then there could not be conflict. Did you have a particular ish, uh, example in mind? Or are you just kind of thinking in theory? Somewhat in theory, but like perhaps it's the, the resurrection story. It, it, that is making direct claims about things which happen, even if it's not, so science attempts to explain mechanisms. Even mm -hmm. if God doesn't provide a mechanism, it still claims that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, again, people who believe the Bible would claim that there doesn't have to be a mechanism in everything. That's where they would differ with a scientific way of thinking. There doesn't have to be a mechanism for everything. After all, God can sometimes be agent of something without a mechanism. And that's what we believe about the Bible. Again, the Bible talks about the mechanism. God raised him from the dead. There's no mechanism there. It's only agency. God is the agent by which Christ was raised. And again, we accept that, and that be, that's one of those things, and maybe one of those very few things where we'd say, and we don't ever expect that there would be a mechanism that we could find, okay? So there are things like that, but again, the Bible's not making a scientific claim, it's claiming a historical reality. What to their mind and to my mind is a historical reality, but they're not positing a scientific understanding that exceeds what the ancient world would have known. Okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thanks for uh, your talk and, and time. Very thought-provoking concepts. I'm curious about. There's a lot of uh, like kind of underpinning a lot of scientific efforts is um, a bit of a deterministic viewpoint, or maybe. I don't know exactly what word to call it, maybe a, a physicalism uh, that you mentioned, for example, that human beings are ontologically different from animals, that there is uh, a, a substantial difference. There's something in that breath of God. Um, science doesn't really acknowledge any duality of body and spirit. Um, I'm kind of curious about some of those ideas. Like, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Well, again, in all those cases, we're confronted in the pages of the Bible with the ancient cultural river. You know, lots of times uh, Christians today think about body, soul, and spirit as if that's a biblical mandate. 
uh, it's more platonic perhaps than it is biblical, um, although I'm not a philosopher, so I don't dabble in, in those things. But the Israelite way of thinking is very different. Um, they believed that everyone had a, an energizing spirit that was God's spirit in them. And that when they died, that spirit was God's and it returned to him. Uh, they believed that there was a part of you which they called the nephesh, the, the self, and your identity. And they saw that as something which is integrated with your, your body, but still distinct from it. And they probably thought that the nephesh went to the netherworld when you died, while the body deteriorated. But again, those are descriptive. They're descriptive of what Israelites believed in their world, which in some ways was very similar to what other people around them believed. It's not the Bible's revelation affirming, and this is the nature of uh, theological anthropology of the human person. So again, we have to be careful about what we think the Bible is claiming or what it happens to be describing. I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> I mean, you want to come back, uh, come back with a clearer, oh, the microphone left. <laughs> No, no. again, those are things that science doesn't make a claim about, and the Bible does make a claim about them, but it's not a scientific claim. It's more a theological claim. Would, would the, uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> would, um, would what you're describing be more of a collective spirit? Uh, you mentioned that God is, the image of God resides in, the, mm -hmm. in humanity as a whole. Is that like a Geist kind of idea that you're trying to develop, maybe? I don't know if I would call it that. Uh, again, all I'm trying to point out is that it's something that is true of humanity. I see the image of God as a task, a function, that God gives humanity to, to do his work of ordering alongside of him. And that's something that God has to give. It's, a, it's not something that's inherent in the brain or that can evolve in the, the anatomy. It's something that God has to give. Again, that's theological. It's not something that science cannot detect the image of God. Anthropologists note this all the time. They dig up remains and, oh, they've got art, or they bury burial goods, or this or that. Uh, they must be what? Well, you can talk about what kind of homo sapiens category they might be in, but none of those things are going to say, oh, so we know that these people are in the image of God. Now, there's nothing that science could detect that would tell you that. So again, that's not a scientific claim. It's a theological claim about human identity. Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm following up a little bit on my brother's question over there, I think, about Paul, but about Jesus, who said that, haven't you read that in the beginning God created them male and female? Mm -hmm. Clearly, he was following the Genesis narrative, putting creation, putting male and female at the beginning rather than a putative 15 billion years or whatever after the beginning. So my question is, if, if Jesus is wrong on this historical point, then what would be the reason to, to believe him when he speaks of more metaphysical things like resurrection? Well, I certainly wouldn't say that Jesus was wrong. Boy, no, we'd never do that, okay? <laughs> but when he's saying from the beginning, you have to ask a question, from the beginning of what? From the beginning, from the fountainhead of humanity as we understand it, that's certainly from the beginning. Um, and therefore, Jesus, again, is accommodating his statement and his message to his audience, which is exactly what we would expect. Just like he says, the mustard is the smallest seed. Biologically or botanically, it's not. But he's accommodating to the knowledge of his day. So again, that doesn't mean Jesus was wrong about seeds. He wasn't making a statement about botany that was intended to stand up to modern scrutiny. And so when he says, from the beginning, it was not so, that is from the beginning of human history as we know it, which of course in the Bible goes back to Adam and Eve, and that's the, that's the group that he's talking about. It'd be, I don't know, maybe similar to what we would say, um, uh, that there's an important uh, distinction 
with regard to, um, to human rights. And from the beginning, it has been so. I mean, there it was in Jefferson and Monroe and Madison. That's from the beginning. But from the beginning of what? That depends on the context of the conversation. So certainly I'm not claiming Jesus was wrong, but he does accommodate his message to his audience. Okay, in the middle. Uh, yeah. uh, so, sorry, someone? Yeah, yeah, I promised I'm going to get to you next. I'm just making my over. Next question. So you said with regard to natural evil that we can think of good as meaning ordered and functional to the extent God needs it to work. Would you be willing to say a little bit more about that, please? Yeah. Um, there's a whole chapter on that in the flood book and another one in a book that I wrote called How to Read Job. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that in biblical terms they just divide the world between good and evil as moral categories. They think in terms of non-order, which is not a moral category. It's just not organized yet. It's like when you move into a house and all the, everything's in boxes. It's non-order. It's not evil. It's just not ordered yet. So you've got non-order, and then you've got order, where God is bringing order, a, a, uh, an order that's adequate for his purposes at that time. The, the world is not fully ordered when God creates because the trappings of non-order are still there, like the sea. You get to new creation in Revelation 21, and there is no sea, because that's total order. But now it's a modicum of order, sufficient order, to begin the process. And when he tells people that they're in his image to subdue and rule, that shows that everything's not fully ordered yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to subdue and rule. And so people are in his image to work alongside of him, to promote order. Of course, they end up choosing to do it their own way. And so then you get what I call disorder. So that's the three, non-order, order, and disorder. Non-order and disorder are both, in some ways, their own individual ways, disruptive of order. But disorder is more like a moral category, although it doesn't have to be. We won't get into that. So in the world, we're in a world of three. There's still non-order. There's order, order that God has made, order that we try to make, and there's disorder that comes about from our disruptions of order from the things that we do. And so to think of the world in those terms instead of just the dichotomy of good and evil, and I think that that's set up from those early chapters in Genesis. Uh, yes, um, so I have two opinions or questions. Um, the first one would be, um, so do, the, the Bible said about like creating light and day in heaven and earth. Um, like, it, like there's so many other planets outside of the universe and also there's electromagnetic ra uh, radiations like microwave, uh, gamma radiations, whatever stuff, more than just the, vis the visible spectrums. So does the Bible exclude those or just don't include it or is light more like a broader general term, not a specific wavelength? Okay. Again, I'm not going to try to define light in scientific terms. That would be reading into the text something which is not part of their cultural river. When they thought about light, it's a period of light that they then named day. God named the period of light day. And so what God creates on day one is day and night, morning and evening. And light is just the means by which he does that. So it's not talking about all forms of light. It's not talking about scientific ideas of light. It's talking about how God brought order to human life as people in the ancient world understood it. And that's by day and night. And that's still pretty, is a, is pretty much a regulatory thing for us, too. Um, how about Earth, then? What about Earth? Um, since, well, most humans live on Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably like all humans live on Earth. Um, but <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Who that's knows? another discussion, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but like, um, why, why don't Bible like um, uh, uh, include other um, life forms if, if that's possible, but I totally believe there's other life forms. So it seems like the Bible become too humanized. That's why it might be limited, I guess, in some aspects. Well, God is only communicating to Israel in its world, in its culture. He's telling them what they need to know to understand their identity in relationship to God so they can see his plans and purposes for them. If God has plans and purposes for other creatures on other planets or other multiverses, 
That's not what God's revealing in the Bible. It's not a revelation of everything about everything. It's a revelation to Israel about how they can understand his plans and purposes related to them. So okay. it's, it's self-limiting by its very nature. It's, it's meant for the specific audience. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So my, 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 my last um, thought would be like, um, you, like what, what you said makes sense. Um, it could appeal to more scientific-minded people and, and to not cause uh, contradictions. So, but like, is what matters really what we believe and, and like this entire um, seminar is to like have more scientific people to believe in faith or, or have more faith in, in Jesus. Um, so okay, the point is like, how, how do you know what you interpret is correct and how do you know that what's being interpreted previously is correct? Which way should we actually follow? Does it, does it only matter like what we believe and what we think makes sense and which we follow is what we decide to? Like, I, like, what's the point of all this and which is correct or not? Thank you. No, that's a great question. And there might be a hundred other people in the room that have that same question. Um, how do we interpret? First of all, what I tell my students all the time is that the hallmark of a strong interpretation is strong evidence. So I don't say, here's the interpretation because it just feels right to me. Or here's the interpretation because the Holy Spirit told me. Or here's the interpretation because John Calvin thought that and I like him. You know, uh, our interpretations find their strength in the evidence that we can bring. But that evidence has to come from the right places. What are the right places? Well, Hebrew has to be understood as part of Hebrew language. And statements in a context have to work in that context, whether it's literary or cultural or otherwise. There has to be a certain coherency and co you know, that, that we expect to find in any decent, reasonable piece of literature. And so we derive our evidence from those things. So we interpret by means, and that sounds very scientific, doesn't it? Interpret by means of the evidence. And our, our hermeneutics, our methodological approaches are really based in an evidentiary sort of approach. Not evidentiary in terms of, can you prove it by science? Or is it empirical, but evidentiary in relationship to the text? Now, why should we be so interested in the text? Well, it's because people who value the text do have a faith investment in the text. Why should we? Why should we have a faith investment in the text? That we should treat it as God's word, treat it as revelation. I mean, that's a pretty high and mighty claim. Why, why should we believe that? And sometimes Christians struggle with that. Why do I believe what the Bible says? And isn't, isn't it a circular argument um, that I believe what the Bible says because I just was raised that way or because lots of people do? Um, it's not because it's inherently plausible. It's not. So why would I put my faith in something like that? For myself, and I can... You know, I think other Christians might express this in the same way. For myself, uh, I consider the Bible's claims, and the Bible does claim to be God's revelation, and I consider that claim credible primarily because of Jesus. That is, Jesus claimed to represent that whole idea. He claims to be Yahweh, God incarnate, that's an incredible claim. And on the surface, implausible. And we might be inclined to say, well, why would I believe that? Why would I believe that we actually could have a God incarnate? Why would I believe that he would, that he would do miracles? Why would I give him the credit? Well, he says he was God. Well, why should I believe him? Right? I mean, you can, it seems like in, eternally, critique all of those claims. And for most Christians, what it comes down to in the end is that he rose from the dead. Now, how do you believe that he rose from the dead? Isn't that circular too? That the Bible says he did, and so you believe that he did? But again, what happens is the Bible offers evidences. Well, maybe I don't like the evidences, and maybe you don't. Okay, again, there's only a, a certain level at which you can prove anything. How many eyewitnesses does it take to persuade you of something? 
And the text makes a pretty concerted effort to give you the evidences that it has to offer about the resurrection. Does faith come into play? Of course it does. Of course faith comes into it. But it's not a, it's not a leap into the dark kind of faith. It's a faith based on the kind of evidence that the text can present. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and then you would believe what he has to say about God and what he has to say about himself, and that affects what we think about the Bible and what it is. So it all, it all goes back to that. I understand for someone who really is not at the point where they can express that level of faith, this continues to be problematic. But that's, that's basically how the Christian mindset is set up. Thanks for asking the question. Hi. Um, you only like, talked about like, how the, the Hebrew um, and how that was influencing how you were reading it. What about the Septuagint and how that, um, what other information does that, because Jesus quoted from that so we can consider it reliable. So. Okay. Now, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that we've, was begun probably as early as the second century BC, so before the time of Christ, okay? And it probably was pretty much the Bible that uh, the Greek-speaking world used, which could have included lots of the disciples and things like that in the first century. Um, it is a translation, okay? But yet it was, it was used, it was quoted in the New Testament. Uh, but that doesn't give us much of a different viewpoint. Again, the Septuagint translators are in the Hellenistic period. So they're not really aware of the ancient world and what these concepts would have meant in the ancient world. They're not trying to translate in that light. They're just doing the best they can in the world that they're in. And there are some Hebrew terms that they don't understand. They just give it their best shot, just like all translators do. All right, I think we've got time for one final question from this section. Or let's just open it up the whole floor and... Oh, perfect, <laughs> and okay. Hands immediately shoot up. <laughs> I've got an eight o'clock class in the morning, so <laughs> two and a half hour drive home. So I feel like I understand your um, foundation for um, scientific evidence and how it plays into scripture, um, but I'm curious how you would account for more historical um, claims of scripture, such as um, like the long life of humans in Genesis 4 or 5, um, and so I guess like the genealogies there. Um, so like, so science aside, how do you reconcile history and historical claims of scripture? A great question. With any part of scripture, we have to make sure we understand the text literarily before we can understand it historically. In other words, we have to understand what it's claiming within its worldview, within its rhetoric, before we can try to talk about what does that mean historically. In the ancient world, they think about numbers very differently than we do. They think about ages differently, time spans differently, uh, there's a certain rhetoric connected with numbers uh, that we don't entirely understand. But again, we can't assume that they think about numbers the same way we do. I was listening to a paper a couple months ago at a professional conference, and the presenter was talking about the uh, use of numbers in the ancient world. And the statement they made, and we could argue with it, I'm sure, but the statement that the, the woman made was, in the Bible, all numbers are rhetorical, even if some of them might even be precise. They are there for their rhetorical value, and maybe for their numerical value, depends. And we're not used to treating numbers like that. There are some numbers we treat that way. I've got plenty of examples that I don't have time to share. Um, but, uh, but again, in that sense, we don't immediately start out and read the genealogies and the long lifespans and say, oh, well, if the Bible is going to be true, this has to be historically precise numbers. Wait a second, Cultural River, let's think about how they use numbers and not be too anxious to read it intuitively. Okay? So, again, I think there's much we can learn by understanding the rhetoric that's involved there. 
Thank you so much for your tenderness, for your questions. Really appreciate it.